Welcome to the Deep Dive. Great to be here. This is season two, episode 16. We're uh, still exploring our season theme, blockchain blueprint, cryptocurrencies, digital assets, and more. Yeah, we've got a good one today. Yeah, definitely. We're tackling something really, really fundamental today. It uh, causes a lot of confusion, I think, especially if you're newer to crypto. Mm -hmm. The core difference between crypto coins and crypto tokens. Yeah, it sounds simple, but it trips people up. Totally. And this deep dive was actually requested by Harper from Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, nice. Shout out to Harper. Yeah. Harper mentioned they've been trading crypto for about three months. So understanding this distinction, it's like super important early on for figuring out the landscape. Harper, this one's definitely for you. Absolutely vital context. And the insights we're going to be drawing on, they come from some excellent source material. Our producer for this episode, Katie St. Ors, she's a digital asset tax specialist, put it together for us. Fantastic. Katie knows her stuff. Right. Because it might seem like just words, coin, token, mm -hmm. but understanding the difference is, well, it's foundational. It really affects how they're made, how they work, even how you might think about their value or their risk. Okay, so let's unpack it then. Based on Katie's stuff, what's that like single defining difference? The one thing everything else kind of flows from. Okay, so it really boils down to uh, the technology, where they actually live. A crypto coin operates on its own blockchain, it its own native network. Right, like Bitcoin runs on the Bitcoin blockchain. Exactly, but a crypto token, it's built on top of an existing blockchain that someone else built and maintains. Ah, okay. So that's not just a small detail then. That's the main architectural split. Precisely. It's the fundamental divergence. So maybe like coins are the native citizens who built their own city on their own land. And tokens are more like guests or maybe businesses building their projects inside somebody else's city using their roads and infrastructure. That's actually a really helpful analogy, yeah. Coins are absolutely fundamental to the infrastructure of their network. They are the network, in a way. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's explore coins first, then. You said they're the native currency. How does that actually work on their own chain? Well, yeah, because they are the native asset for that specific blockchain. Their primary job is often like traditional money, but, you know, digital and decentralized. Mm -hmm. A medium of exchange, a store of value. Mm -hmm. But they're also totally integral to just keeping the network running. The sources Katie gave us explain how they're used to uh, incentivize the people securing the network. Right, the miners or validators. Exactly. Whether it's miners doing proof of work, like with Bitcoin, solving those puzzles, or validators staking their own coins in proof of stake systems like Ethereum now. The coin itself is the reward for doing that essential security work. Gotcha. And you also need them to actually do stuff on the network, right? Like paying gas fees on Ethereum with Ether. Precisely. Yeah, any transaction, any smart contract you run on a blockchain, it costs a little bit of that native coin. It's how you pay the miners or validators for processing your request. It's basically the network's fuel. Okay. Oh, and the material also mentions that coins are generally fungible, meaning like one Bitcoin is pretty much the same as any other Bitcoin. Interchangeable. Like dollar bills. Okay. Yeah. And creating a new coin, that sounds like way more involved than creating a token. Oh, significantly, yeah. To launch a brand new crypto coin, you basically have to build an entirely new blockchain network. Right. From the ground up. Wow. Yeah, it's a massive job. Huge technical challenge. Needs a lot of resources. You've got to set up the whole mining or staking system to make sure it's secure right from the start. It's complex. Okay, makes sense. So since they're these foundational currencies, how does their value get determined? What drives the price? Well, a lot of it comes down to basic economics, you know, <laughs> supply and demand in the market is a huge factor. Sure. But the sources show it's uh, it's deeper than just that. Yeah. How much the network is actually being used and growing that's critical. The more people using the blockchain, the more valuable the native coin tends to become. Right. Network effects. Exactly. Trade in your boring job for a brilliant career using Adobe Creative Cloud. Start learning now with the free trial link in the description. And the project fundamentals. Like, what's the tech? What's the goal of this blockchain? Does it solve a real problem? And importantly, their monetary policy. Things like, does it have a fixed supply cap, like Bitcoin's 21 million? Or how quickly are new coins created? That scarcity factor really impacts its potential as a store of value. Got it. Can you give us some clear examples of coins from the material? Sure. The big one, obviously, is Bitcoin, BTC. Then you got Ethereum, ETH, even though it hosts lots of tokens. Ether itself is the native coin. Solana, SOL, Cardano, <laughs> ADA, uh, Dogecoin, D-O-G-E, Litecoin, LTC. Yeah. They all run on their own separate blockchains. 
Okay, cool. That paints a really clear picture of coins. Native to their own chains, act like digital money, fuel the network, hard to create because you build the whole system, Mm -hmm. value tied to network and economics. Got it. Mm -hmm. Now let's flip it. Crypto tokens. How do they get created and why is it so different? Right. So the fundamental thing, again, they don't have their own blockchain. They're created and they live on an existing blockchain. Using smart contracts, you mentioned. Exactly. The sources really emphasize this. Most tokens are created using smart contracts. Okay, smart contracts. We hear that term all the time. Can you break down what that really means for creating a token? Yeah, sure. Hmm. Think of a smart contract as like a digital vending machine, maybe. Right. Or just a self-executing agreement written in code that lives on the blockchain. Oh. It's code that automatically enforces rules and runs actions when certain conditions are met. So instead of building a whole new blockchain city, you use these smart contracts on an existing city's platform like Ethereum or Solana or others to define the rules and features of your specific token. It's like building an app on an operating system rather than building a whole new operating system. Ah, okay, so creating a token is generally way simpler. Because you're not building the underlying tech yourself. Exactly. You're basically leveraging the security, the infrastructure, the network effects of the host blockchain that's already there and running. It dramatically lowers the barrier to entry technically and financially compared to launching a whole new coin and its blockchain. You deploy the contract code and bam, your token exists on that chain. Right. Okay. And here's where it gets really interesting, I think. Tokens aren't just digital money, are they? The sources really hammered home their versatility. Yes, this is the absolute key reason why there are so many tokens out there. Because smart contracts are programmable, you can design tokens to represent almost anything, not just currency. Like what? Well, they can represent assets, specific rights, access to things, utility, even unique digital stuff. The material KD provided breaks them down into a few helpful categories. Okay, like utility tokens, what are those? Yeah, so utility tokens are designed basically to give you access, access to a specific product or service within a particular project's ecosystem. Ah, okay. Sources mention examples like um, basic attention token, BAT, you use that within the Brave browser ecosystem, or Filecoin, which is used to pay for decentralized data storage space. The token gives you utility. Gotcha. What about security tokens? They sound well, serious, like traditional finance. They definitely bridge that gap. These are tokens that are digital representations of actual traditional financial assets, things like stocks in a company or bonds, or even like fractional ownership of real estate. Wow, okay. And because they represent ownership in these external, often regulated assets, the sources point out they usually fall under existing financial regulations. They're treated much more like traditional securities. Right. Makes sense. And governance tokens. They let you vote or something. Correct. Yeah. Holding governance tokens typically gives you voting power. You get a say in proposals about the future development or the rules of a decentralized application, a DApp or a protocol. Any examples? Uniswap's UNI token is a really common example. If you hold UNI, you can vote on changes to how the Uniswap decentralized exchange works. Okay. And then there are NFTs non-fungible tokens. We hear so much about those. The sources were clear. These are a different beast entirely. Totally different. Yeah, the critical difference with NFTs is, well, it's in the name, non-fungible. They're unique. Unlike coins or other tokens, which are interchangeable. Exactly. While one UNI token is the same as another UNI token, each NFT is distinct. It represents ownership of one specific unique asset. It could be digital art, a collectible, virtual land in a metaverse, even like a ticket to an event sometimes. They're not interchangeable. Got it. Unique digital property rights, basically. Essentially, yeah. Okay, and finally, the sources mention stable coins like Tether, USDT, and USD Coin, USDC. What's their deal? Ah, stable coins. They're a super important type of token. They're specifically designed to minimize the price volatility you see with most other cryptos. How do they do that? Usually by being pegged or tied to the value of a stable asset. Most commonly, that's a fiat currency like the U.S. dollar. So one USDT or one USDC aims to always be worth roughly one U.S. dollar. Which makes them useful for? For trading between other cryptos without having to cash out to dollars or for just holding value in the crypto ecosystem without being exposed to those wild price swings. And the material also pointed out something interesting. Stablecoins like USDT and USDC can actually exist as tokens on multiple different blockchains at the same time. Oh, really? How does that work? They just deploy versions of their smart contract on different compatible chains like Ethereum, Solana, Tron, etc. 
So you can send USDT on the Ethereum network or on the Solana network, leveraging the capabilities of each. Trade in your boring job for a brilliant career using Adobe Creative Cloud. Start learning now with the free trial link in the description. Okay, so tokens. Live on existing chains via smart contracts, much easier to create, incredibly versatile representing everything from utility access to unique art to stable value. What about their security and how they get their value compared to coins? Good question. So a token security is directly linked to the security of the blockchain it lives on. If, say, Ethereum has a major security issue, which is unlikely, but hypothetically, it could potentially impact all the ERC-20 tokens built on it. They inherit the security of the host. Okay, so they rely on the underlying chain. Right, and their valuation. It's typically tied much more closely to the specific project or asset the token represents. Is the project useful? Is it gaining adoption? Is there demand for the utility it provides for the asset it represents? It's less about the broad health of the entire blockchain network itself and more about the success of that specific token's ecosystem. Got it. So let's just quickly recap those key differences we've pulled out from Katie's material just to nail it down. Sure. So number one, the underlying tech. Coins have their own native blockchain. Tokens are built on an existing blockchain. Right. Then primary purpose. Coins are mainly currency, store of value, network fuel. Tokens represent a huge range of things. Assets, utility, rights, much more diverse. Yep. Then creation. Making a coin involves building a whole new blockchain that's a complex, resource-intensive. Making a token uses smart contracts on an existing chain, relatively much lower barrier to entry. And complexity follows from that high for coins, relatively low for tokens. Exactly. And the examples help cement it. Coins like Bitcoin, Ether, Solana, tokens like USDT, UNI, all the NFTs, BAT, Linko, tons of them. Perfect. That core distinction, native blockchain versus built on existing, really does explain all the other differences, doesn't it? It absolutely does. Everything cascades from that. Okay. So, Harper, thinking about you trading for these past three months, why is actually understanding this practical? Why does this coin versus token distinction matter day to day for someone navigating the crypto world? Ah, uh, yeah, this is where it becomes really practical, not just theoretical. For investment analysis, for starters, you look at different things. How so? Well, for a coin, you're analyzing the health, the security, the adoption, the potential growth of the entire blockchain network. For a token, you're digging into the specifics of that project. What's its use case? Who's the team? Is there real demand for the service or asset it represents? The analysis focus is different. Okay, that makes sense. It also just helps you understand the... Uh the architecture of what you're interacting with, right? Like a mental map. Absolutely. You get a clearer picture of how the whole ecosystem fits together. Is this a foundational layer one blockchain or is it an application built on top? Mm -hmm. And that ties into risk assessment too. Right. How does the risk differ? Knowing if it's a coin or token tells you where the main security dependency lies. Mm. Is the project team responsible for securing an entire independent blockchain, like with a coin? Or is the token security largely dependent on the robustness of a bigger host network like Ethereum or Solana. The risk profiles can be different. And regulation too, which the material touched on, that can be a minefield. For sure. Different types of digital assets might face very different regulatory scrutiny, especially things classified as security tokens. So understanding whether something is fundamentally a coin, a utility token, or maybe a security token is becoming increasingly important for navigating that legal and regulatory landscape. Okay, wow. This has been a... Uh really clarifying deep dive. Mm. We've seen that this seemingly simple split coins on their own chains, tokens on existing ones, leads to huge differences, how they're made, what they do, how you even think about their value and risk. Mm -hmm. Coins are the native fuel, the currency of their own blockchains. Tokens are these incredibly versatile applications, assets, utilities, built using smart contracts on the infrastructure others have already laid down. And getting that fundamental distinction right, it's just crucial for anyone interacting with crypto confidently. Whether you're trading like Harper or maybe thinking about building something or even just trying to make sense of the news, it's step one, really. Definitely. Okay, so here's a final thought for you, our listeners, to maybe chew on. It's based on something Katie St. Orr's material hinted at. These lines between coin and token, they aren't always set in stone. Ah, uh, right. The evolution aspect. Exactly. Sometimes projects actually start as tokens. They launch on an existing chain because it's easier, faster, lets them build a community. But then if they get big enough, successful enough, they might actually launch their own mainnet, their own blockchain, and migrate their token holders over to a new native coin. 
Ethereum itself kind of did that in its very, very early conceptual stages, existing partly on the Bitcoin blockchain before its own launch. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you next time. See you later. Okay, great. That's a wrap. I'm Katie St. Ors, and let me send out a huge thank you for listening. If you want more content on personal finance and small business, head over and find me on YouTube. You can also find me on Spotify, Amazon Music, TikTok, and Apple iTunes. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll catch you on the next Deep Dive podcast.